Okay, good morning again. Um, thank you again to all of you for joining us. Thank you in particular to our speakers who I will introduce in just a moment um, and to our partners and sponsors. We are really very excited about this webinar today. Um, I know that we've all probably been participating in a lot of webinars in the last you know, six to eight weeks, um, but we're particularly excited about this one um, and really appreciate everyone taking time out of their valuable day and um, pushing through the sort of um, Zoom fatigue to be here and see what we can learn today. So thank you so much. Um, today we're going to be talking, we, which is part of our telehealth webinar series for school-based health centers. This is the fourth one about medical best practices. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us, we started off talking about behavioral health um, and platforms and billing, and then we have some upcoming webinars, and they are all on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org. So we're consolidating all of the resources that we find and putting them there. Um, so if you miss some of them and want to go back and hear them or um, follow links to other websites, that should all be on our website. Some quick business. Um, obviously, if you can't hear me, then you can't do this, but hopefully if you're not hearing us, you can call in using these numbers. Um, and if you're not getting great audio, then often calling in can work better than doing the audio via the internet. So if you're hearing me in a scratchy way, feel free to go ahead and try calling in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording this webinar, and both the webinar itself as well as the supporting materials will be on our website um, to see your reference. In fact, I've heard someone recently recommend um, that as we all participate in these web-based meetings, that we take them all um, outside while walking and then go back and reference the source documents later. So if you want to just listen, um, I'm sure um, that Dr. Bielodowski, um will understand if you listen rather than watch, and, um, and you can go back and, and read the actual slides later. I thought that was good advice. I will be here <laughs> watching with you all, but if you want to take it outside, you should. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are the California School Based Health Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit um, that um, exists to support school based health centers both in their startup to help new school based health centers open as well as to help them serve more students and serve students better. Um, so we do this in a lot of ways that I won't go into today because that could take a whole hour. Um, but uh, we're thrilled to say that there's almost 300 school-based health centers in California, the most of any state in the country, uh, and more opening each day. Well, okay, maybe not each day, but each month we get at least a new one. Um, and we have tons of information on our website, a lot of toolkits, a lot of trainings. We do individual technical assistance with school-based health centers and school districts and schools. Um, and we have an annual conference, which I will a little bit more about right now. Um, a quick shout out to becoming a member. Most school based health centers in California are members of our organization as well as other supporting organizations. Um, and one of the best reasons to do that is that you get discount for membership, I mean, discount for conference. And um, our conference this year was supposed to be two weeks ago, but of course, like everyone else, we um, had to postpone. And we have moved it to a virtual conference the first week of October. So, more details forthcoming about that. Um, but if you are a member, you will get a, a discount on registration. So we highly encourage that, and you can look at our website for more information. Um, this so far has been a four-part series, and we want to give a really big shout out to Molina for supporting the series. Um, also, our partners, sorry, background noise, um, the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, the Public Partnership, we're about to hear from Maya Alvarez, um, the LA Trust for Children's Health, and again, our sponsor, Molina. And we do have a continuation of the series coming up soon um, next. Wednesday, the third, um, is a session on youth engagement, and then the Thursday after that is consent and confidentiality, and then we're currently planning two more after that. So keep on the lookout for those, and if you're not on our email list to get notified every time we schedule a new one, you can just go to our website and add yourself there. So um, first I want to say thank you so much to Myra Alvarez, she is the Executive Director of the Children's Partnership, and she's going to help frame for us the bigger sort of uh, policy, bigger landscape of telehealth in California. Um, and then we'll take it back from there. So Myra, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to join our partners on this important webinar. And to all of you for spending time with us to continue the discussion about the importance of telehealth, particularly in today's public health crisis but also always really recognizing the value and power of technology to ensure every student has access to the care they need where they need it. 
For those of you that don't know us, I hope you'll get to know the Children's Partnership. Uh, we're a, a policy and advocacy organization that specifically focuses on child health and well-being. We've been around for about 25 years, really trying to uplift the needs of particularly marginalized communities of kids over the last few years have really focused on efforts on children of color, particularly children and immigrant families, and the challenges that the current federal climate is uh, impacting their, how it's impacting their well-being. Um, but we also work with organizations across the state of California and the country to ensure that we're uplifting community models, community interventions, what's working in, in the corners of our cities uh, to make sure that uh, children and families are accessing the services and resources that they need to stay healthy and, and succeed. Um, we do that in collaboration with many of you, and we're grateful for that opportunity and look forward to continuing that work with you. Uh, I have the opportunity to share a little bit about what we've talked about with regard to telehealth over this series in partnership um, with the School-Based Health Alliance and the Telehealth Policy Coalition, the LA Trust, and others. We want to make sure that our school-based health center audience knows the important changes to telehealth, particularly key Medi-Cal policy changes that allow greater access to care for students uh, across the state. In particular, uh, we wanna make sure that folks know that telehealth can be provided to both new and established patients. This is particularly important um, given the flexibility that are now allowed under some of the federal guidance and California guidance that makes clear where patients can be established. Um, it's important to also note that the patient and the provider can be located at their homes, at the clinic sites, or at community sites. Again, as we move forward and rebuild from this crisis, giving these necessary flexibilities to students and their families are particularly important to strengthen access to care. Um, visits are paid at parity with in-person visits, including telephone. This is especially important to our provider community so that there is clarity around payment and the opportunity to utilize telehealth services to deliver care. And then finally, there was important guidance issued around acceptable platforms to use for telehealth services. And those platforms are ones that many of us are very familiar with in this environment, Zoom, Skype, and Google Hangouts. Um, that flexibility ensures that, again, during this important time where access to care is really slipping through, through the fingers of many of our families and our, and our students, um, that there is the opportunity to use everyday technology that many of us do have uh, to make sure we are seeing our healthcare professionals. Uh, but as Amy mentioned, there's a few other webinars coming up because there's still much more work to do. And where do we go from here when it comes to ensuring that access to telehealth is improving um, access to care more broadly? Um, as we know, access to telehealth services is not equal across the state of California. Uh, in a recent poll that the Education Trust West, as well as the Children's Partnership and many others released that just a few weeks ago, over 90% of 600 parents that were surveyed made clear that there was an interest in utilizing telehealth, but only 18% are currently able to do so. Uh, there were many different uh, variables that impact access to telehealth. But the, the, the stark difference between a 94% interest in utilizing it and an 18% capacity to do so really raises um, serious bells, uh, serious alarms to ensure that we're doing more to ensure our most vulnerable have access to these opportunities. And thinking about how we can expand and make access to telehealth more sustainable into the future, uh, we want to make sure that some of these guidance and flexibilities remain in place. Uh, we want to make sure that our school-based health centers, our schools, have those additional resources for student mental health supports, especially recognizing once this rebuild starts and how mental health will continue to be a priority for students. And then finally, investing in those strategies that close the digital divide that don't further exacerbate the inequities that we know are existing today, but that we're working together to level that playing field so the, the availability of telehealth is felt across the board. Um, for those of you, again, that do not know our website or, or our email, it's right there, and hopefully you'll be able to utilize that. There's a, a number of resources related to telehealth. Um, we did release recently a roadmap for action that provides schools some necessary steps around um, implementing a telehealth program. And then coming soon, we are developing materials in partnership with the California Telehealth Policy Coalition and others and part of this important coalition uh, to ensure that families have the resources that they need to utilize these services, including translated materials around telehealth, 
as well as more family-friendly materials that speak to families um, in their language in a, in a way that communicates with them the importance of using telehealth as a tool to keep themselves and, and their children healthy. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Amy to introduce our speaker and continue the conversation. Thank you. I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Myra. We're really grateful to um, the Children's Partnership and the Telehealth Policy Coalition and all the work that you do, and we're really happy to keep partnering with you. So thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to thank and introduce our um, presenter, Dr. Mario Bielatowski um, from UC San Diego and Radies Children's Hospital. Um, he is a pediatrician and physician informaticist at Radies Children's Hospital in San Diego. He's also the Director of Quality and Informatics in Urgent Care. He completed his medical education at UC San Diego and Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and he's an Assistant Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at UC San Diego. So um, we were recommended to him as being one of the um, most helpful thinkers around medical best practices in telehealth, and we're really happy to have him join us today. So thank you, Dr. Bielatowski, um, and I will pass the presenter to you. Um, and also just a quick reminder to folks that we will have time for questions and answers at the end, and you are welcome to submit your questions and answers at any time in either the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll consolidate them um, for Dr. Bielatowski at the end. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and thank you, Myra, as well. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, so my hope today is to just kind of give a brief overview of some of the medical aspects as well as some of the uh, technological aspects of telemedicine uh, and how that relates to medical care. I mean, obviously, we've all been thrown with this pandemic into a, a brand new world. And um, it's really interesting to me because I, you know, as an informaticist, I get to play around with computers and technology. So this has been a great way to uh, mix my both passions, which is, you know, direct patient care as well as technology. Um, so I'm going to try to go, you know, not too slow, but not too fast, but I do want to give some time for questions uh, at the end of this presentation. So I'm really going to try to time myself appropriately because uh, I do want this to be more of a conversation rather than just me talking at you. Um, and so what we've covered a little bit is, you know, just kind of some basics and then as well as I think one of the critical things in with telemedicine is, is the importance of workflows and thinking about how you will see and treat your patients, uh, because there are some important implications in the way that you need to do things. Uh, so this is kind of our tentative agenda. Obviously, if questions arise and we need to slow down, we need to speed up, uh, this can be, you know, very flexible. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, people use it, the word telemedicine, telehealth, uh, they're pretty much equivalent. Uh, and it's just, you know, there's different definitions out there. If you use the, the CMS definition, it's just a, a two-way, you know, real-time communication between a physician and a patient. Um, and at times, like, like it was said earlier, that a clinician could be at home, they could be in their office, uh, the patient could be in their home, they could also be in the office. Uh, there's a mix of really what this means nowadays, uh, you know, in, in certain specialties where there are multiple providers, uh, a couple of providers could be in the office and some of them could be remote. Uh, but, you know, the way that I think about it is just, it's a way of delivering, me delivering medical care when not all the parties uh, are in the same location. Um, and I think that's just an easy way to think about it. Uh, and like Myra said, I mean, you can pretty much do almost anything via telemedicine, right? So you can have new or established visits. Um, you know, a lot of the services that were out there that were being utilized before the pandemic were more of the six day, uh, like six visits, six same day. So a lot of the uh, available providers uh, before everybody else got into the into the the playing field, it was just about you know telemedicine, urgent care. But that's not the only thing that can be done via telemedicine. You can have behavioral health evaluations, you can have uh, medication management visits. Um, at Ray Children's, we still do therapy. So we do speech therapy, we, we even do physical therapy. Um, you can still talk with your uh, psychiatrist, um, your psychologist. A lot of those things can be done via telemedicine. Um, you know, and as far as a medical provider, you can still evaluate patients to see if they need to see a specialist or if this is still something that you can treat yourself. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, this is the part of telemedicine where you can bring in a third party 
uh, which is bringing in a specialist to consult during the actual uh, visit. And sometimes this is done in an inpatient setting when there's people who are hospitalized, that the specialist is not in-house, uh, they can telemedicine into the visit. But it, this can also be done as an outpatient. Um, so really, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do with telehealth and telemedicine. You know, from a medical standpoint, I think, you know, it is important to, to point out some of the limitations before we speak about, you know, how great this is and how much it could improve access to, to care for families who are, you know, live far away from a medical center, um, you know, don't have uh, access to, to specialists in the area that they live. Uh, and even sometimes, you know, there's uh, not a lot of PCPs in the area. So, um, so some of the limitations is that when you're seeing the patient virtually, uh, you're limited to what you can see and what you can hear uh, based on what tools you have available. Uh, so for example, oftentimes patient pediatrics will do tests like a rapid strep or a flu, or you know, right now we will do a COVID PCR. Uh, so a lot of those require that you know, somebody actually swab the patient and run the lab. And that's one of the limitations uh, of telemedicine. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, in addition to you know, a lot of the complaints that we see in pediatrics and children are respiratory problems. Uh, and without the use of special hardware, which does exist, but most of us don't use and don't have, is that you cannot listen to people's hearts, you cannot listen to their lungs, um, and you cannot look inside their ears unless you have the special tools. Um, and again, most of those tools you would need to have in a clinic setting. So even if you weren't there, the family would come in and somebody would hold a stethoscope to their chest uh, or um, or you know the camera into the ears. Although there are some pretty cheap ones out there uh, that some specialists do use. Uh, so for example, the ear nose and those specialists do have some tools. Uh, so after they put ear tubes in a patient, they can actually send them home with a device that connects to their computer or their cell phone and allows the families to put the little camera into the ear so that the ear nose and throat doctor can look at their ears from a, you know from afar. Uh, but for most of us, you would just be using a patient's camera from their cell phone or from their computer. And so it is just what you can see, right? So if they open their mouth, you can see their mouth and you can see rashes on their skin, uh, but you're not necessarily gonna be utilizing special tools. So that's one of the limitations. Um, you know, and, and in order to get started, you know, there's lots of resources out there. Um, if, you know, you're implementing this completely from scratch, but the basic things that you need is a way to interact with the family, right? And, and you also need a way to document uh, most of us uh, have electronic medical records these days, although, you know, some places are still on paper, and that's fine. Uh, you just need to make sure that you have an ability to, to still document your visit, right? So if you're going to bill for this and you want to keep good records, uh, you have to be able to access your EHR. And so if you're not going to be present at the site, let's say you're going to be doing this from home, then you need to make sure that you have remote access to your EHR. Now, in some places, uh, the clinicians are still in the clinic, uh, and it's just the patients that are remote and that's fine. Um, you also need a video conferencing platform and I think uh, there's been talks earlier about what acceptable platforms there are and I'll give a list as well. Um, you know there's this question about integrating with your EHR so this is not necessary right so this requires a lot of infrastructure build at times and it requires quite a bit of specialization. If you don't have the infrastructure it's not necessarily needed. Um, it's useful in, in terms of having it when you have a way of validating identities, right? So you can verify that the parent is the parent of the person that you're trying to reach and that the child is who they say they are because they have an account in your, um, in your web portal if you have one. But that is not necessary. And a lot of the rules right now have been relaxed to allow for that. Uh, so, you know, as it was mentioned, Zoom, Google Hangouts, um, you know, there's many other platforms that can be used. Uh, so just so you know, EHR integration is not a must, uh, but it is useful. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is, as we said, you know, a lot of families wish that they could access their, their providers via telemedicine. And I think one of the, the things that we've personally uh, found out is that a lot of it means that you have to advertise, right? So a lot of your families have been, you know, locked away for the past almost two months and perhaps not going to see you in person, whether it is because you were actually close or they were just afraid to being, of being exposed to COVID. Uh, so you got to reach out to them and reconnect with them and advertise, hey, these are the services that we are offering and that you can see us via telemedicine. Uh, and lastly, I mean, I think some of the, you know, the, the issues that we encounter when you look at 
socioeconomic status and who does better in telemedicine, I think part of it may be due to access to the technology, right? So luckily for us, most people do have access to uh, a mobile phone, uh, a smartphone, and that is enough to do telemedicine. Uh, but oftentimes you still need a, you know, at least good cell reception. So if you live in a pretty rural area and you don't have 4G, uh, it's pretty tough to do a video visit on 3G or, or less than that. Uh, or Wi-Fi, you know, so I've definitely in my personal practice um, as an urgent care physician have encountered issues with families not having good cell reception and then also don't, not even having internet at home. Uh, so it gets a little tricky uh, to do the telemedicine, right? Because telehealth, telemedicine, in, it, it's supposed to involve the video as well. So it's not just audio, uh, it's video. Now, um, there are some ways to troubleshoot that and we can get into that. But ideally, you are supposed to have videos so that you can see the patient and have a real you know, face-to-face -face encounter. Um, so just real brief, because uh, I know there's been other uh, materials out there. Uh, this is from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, they you know, recommend kind of Zoom and WebEx and Google and Skype. Uh, you know, there's a lot of relaxation of the existing rules, uh, especially with respect to HIPAA. However, I still always urge people to kind of try to make sure that you're complying to the best of your ability to the regulations. Uh, just because HIPAA was relaxed uh, doesn't mean that you should be, you know, not following best practices, right? You probably shouldn't be um, uh, not verifying that people are who they say they are. You probably shouldn't be sharing the same meeting ID with everybody that you're, you're you know, if you're going to use Zoom, for example, uh, you know, don't use your personal meeting ID but generate a new meeting for each patient that you're going to see and, you know, try to protect it with a password, uh, you know, just to ensure that not a random person is going to join a visit. And you can imagine in webinars, I think there's been a lot of issues with what's called Zoom bombing where somebody comes in. So imagine how awful that would be if you're with your medical provider talking about a very sensitive topic and then somebody joins in because they have the link to the visit. So you want to make sure that those links are unique uh, and that your password protecting them um, and lastly, I mean, if you are going to build this, you know, serious telehealth infrastructure, uh, you might want to enter in what's called a uh, business associate agreement, uh, BAA, with the platform that you're using. And that's just kind of standard when you're having uh, any sort of third party uh, interact with your medical care. Uh, this just ensures compliance with HIPAA regulations. Now, um, there is the reason why I have proximity here, even though it's not in the HHA site. Uh, a lot of providers use Doximity because they use uh, MI on for scheduling. And Doximity has this app where you can call families and it kind of changes your phone number so it doesn't show up from your cell phone. Uh, and they also have the ability to do a video chat that does not require the patient to install any software, uh, which is really interesting because one of the uh, issues that you'll run into is families having to install software that they don't have. I think right now almost everybody has Zoom or other platforms, but uh, some of them don't have it. And so this platform is really interesting because they don't require any install on the on the user end, so then the patient's end. And then the other thing is that Doximity claims, and you know, again, you might have to talk touch base with your compliance officer at your uh, facility, uh, they claim that you enter into a BAA automatically. Um, so you know, those are things to to consider. Uh, but you know, that's more on the on the compliance end. So, you know, on the medical end, I think some of the things you really need to think of and one of the most important items to consider are workflows. Um, how are you going to change the way that you practice medicine because of telemedicine, right? So um, you currently probably have people that assist you, whether it's office staff, uh, MAs, LDNs, RNs, um, you know, sometimes you room patients yourself, but you might have somebody who rooms them for you. So when you're talking about telemedicine, you know, the rooming process is very virtual. Uh, however, you can still have them, let's say you do a depression screening, right? So like a THQ uh, or you do some uh, ACES screening uh, or any other screening that you normally do in the office, you can still have your MA or whoever's doing it do that remotely, right? So they could join the visit before you. They can ask the family to weigh the child. They can ask them to take a temperature. If that's particularly important. Um, and they can do that for you just the same way that they would do it in the office. Uh, but that is something that you need to think about. And, um, one of the biggest things is also scheduling, and I'll go into more detail that in a second. Um, and then, you know, there are very specific things to telemedicine, and I think 
um, a lot of people have questions about that is with respect to consent. So anytime you treat a patient, there should be some sort of consent. Um, and oftentimes this is done the first time that a patient is seen. So uh, you might have to talk to compliance officers, but uh, if they've already signed it in person, it might still apply to telemedicine. Uh, for us at RAISE, we just have a policy that every time we do a telemedicine visit, we just consent them that they agree that they're doing this via telemedicine. Uh, and it's just a simple statement that you would write in your notes. Um, and then again, you know, this kind of goes back to the MA and looming part of it. How are you going to obtain bioscience by support? A lot of conditions, it is important to have a weight, uh, especially if you're trending um, to see if they're gaining weight uh, or if they're on a medication that could lead to uh, decrease appetite. So a lot of the behavioral health medicines can decrease appetite. So you want to make sure that they're maintaining their weight. Um, uh, you want to know if they actually have a fever. Uh, you could actually teach patients and their families how to check a heart rate and a respiratory rate. Um, often some of these could also be the so respiratory rate. You could actually see it on video. If they haven't lifted up the shirt of the child, you could see the respiratory rate. Um, but the other thing you need to think about is how to handle patients that you see via telemedicine and decide, hey, we should actually see them in person. Um, so those are things that you really need to think about as you implement um, a telemedicine program because you don't want to deal with this after it happens and be like stuck into what do I do now? So you want to have a plan and guidelines. Um, so this is an example from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's just a workflow uh, of how, you know, patients could schedule. Uh, and you can see here at the top that the patient requests an appointment, and you have a scheduler slash screener who kind of, you know, if you have a predefined list of criteria that you are okay with seeing via telemedicine, so then they schedule the patient, they give them instructions how to log in, uh, and then both the patient and the provider arrive, they have a routine visit, which is a history, they get examined. Uh, if you, you prescribe medications needed and, uh, you know, determine the follow-up. Uh, and also, you know, if you determine like, hey, they need to be seen right away, then, you know, the family would go to the office. And so this is kind of like a very standard workflow. Um, and again, you know, you, you might want to talk to the compliance officer about, are you going to charge for both visits? Is that even okay? Uh, most places will not charge for the subsequent visit because it's usually the same day. Like if they started with telemedicine, and then all of a sudden they have to convert it to an in-person visit. Most of them will just charge for the in-person visit, but that is, you know, one of the things to to consider. Um, so, you know, going back to the scheduling part, I think that this is pretty critical. So you have to determine, you know, are you going to have a strict criteria saying like, you know, rash is okay, fever is okay, um, you know, certain certain uh, chief complaints that you're okay with seeing with telemedicine and having your scheduling department um, or whoever does the scheduling have that list. Uh, or uh, some places what they do is they actually have them talk to the NP or the doctor and the doctor talks to them on the phone really briefly. Um, and then they decide, hey, this is okay for telemedicine. Now, I would say, you know, you, if you get into that triage on the phone, you almost can have an entire visit that way. So you have to think about, you know, what's your bandwidth um, and what would you prefer? Um, you know, for us, uh, for me, we do urgent care. So, you know, we don't really do any sort of triage. We just let families uh, self-schedule. Uh, if they schedule and we deem it that they need to be seen in person, then we send them to one of our open live in-person urgent cares. Otherwise, we just treat it over uh, over the telemedicine. Uh, but again, you know, whether you have a list of acceptable chief complaints, whether you have a dedicated screener, um, and then you know, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that a lot of us uh, will still have an open office, uh, and so one of the recommendations is to really have physical as well as temporal distancing, meaning that uh, when you still have an office in person, you wanna have enough space um, so that people are not next to each other in a waiting room. So, you know, one of the things you might wanna think about is how are you gonna design your, your schedule for the whole day? Are you gonna have the mornings for well children? So kids that don't really have fevers, they're not sick, uh, and then have the afternoon for just sick visits or the opposite, but trying to maintain some sort of separate space, whether it's a separate waiting room, even separate doctors, a lot of offices, uh, we'll have separate uh, practitioners um, who see the well visits and separate practitioners who see the sick visits. And again, that's to try to decrease exposure. Um, and so those are things you really have to think about. And there's, you know, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer, but those are important considerations. Um, and just getting a little bit into the, the medicine part, I think uh, for those of you who have never done telemedicine, you know, the question becomes, like, well, can you actually examine a child? Can you actually examine a patient? Uh, without being there with them in the room. And I just posted here kind of my template for a physical exam that I do 
for urgent care and, and you know it kind of hits pretty much all uh, the organ systems and you know for example for respiratory I mean you cannot listen to the lungs but I can see how they're breathing right so if a child has asthma and you know the complaint was difficulty breathing and I see them retracting and tugging and flaring they got to go somewhere right so um, and that's okay I mean that's part of your exam so what I'm trying to show here is one is feel free to copy this for, for your notes and for your templates uh, but you can get a pretty thorough exam um, via telemedicine so you know one of my biggest things that I tell families is to use a mobile phone instead of a laptop because uh, they can just move the phone around and really show you the rash or like you know you can have them shine a light and, and look at the throat and get a better look um, again you know some of the things that people complain about sore throat ear pain you know there are times where you you know you can get a pretty good exam uh, but again one of the policies that you're going to have to figure out for your organization and for your uh, for your health center is you know what guidelines are we going to keep following and you know, my recommendation is you know still be a good antibiotic steward right and just because they have an ear pain doesn't necessarily mean that they have an ear infection and just because they have a throat pain and the throat looks red doesn't mean that it's strep right so uh, you have to come up with a way of still treating pain you know having some home care which is consistent with existing AP and ENT guidelines for ear pain uh, and then if the pain persists the fever persists then they got to be seen in person so you can actually check those ears and make sure there's no true uh, bacterial infection uh, but again I think those are policies at an organization level, uh, but I think you can still be a good antibiotic steward and still get good exams and still deliver good medical care without, you know, placing your hands on the patient. And I think one of the things that I really wanted to point out here is the ab abdominal exam. Uh, you can get a pretty good abdominal exam by having the parent palpate. Um, so again, I mean, you can see what the reaction is from the patient. You can ask the parent, hey, touch the, you know, right lower side. You know, if they have right lower quadrants and you, know, you got to be concerned for appendicitis. Um, you know, your management will be different, but you can get a pretty thorough and a pretty good exam virtually. Um, so, you know, I think both families and providers, the more they use it, they, they, they realize that it's actually a pretty good substitute for an office visit. Uh, but as much as this, you know, webinar is about telehealth, telemedicine, uh, you know, like I said earlier, there are some limitations and there are times where an in-person visit is, is really critical. And, and kind of to that point, uh, when you follow the guidance of the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, for children less than two years of age, uh, for well child visits, the recommendation is still to see them in person. Uh, and, that, you know, that kind of goes to having a safe environment uh, where you're separating the sick from the not sick. And like we said, you know, whether you can have a separate provider for them or not. Uh, but, you know, in general, even for older kids, they still say that whenever possible, the well visits should be done in person. Uh, but I think, you know, that there is recognition that you can have a hybrid model uh, where part of the visit is done uh, via telemedicine, uh, via telehealth. Uh, you can do, you know, a lot of the screenings, a lot of the conversation part, quite a bit of the exam, um, and then you know they would still have to be seen in person for the additional screenings like vision and hearing and uh, hemoglobin when it's uh, part of the recommended guidelines. And so, so some of the things are you, you have to think about. Uh, but one of the biggest things to consider is that you know there's a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of families who are very hesitant to come into an office uh, and so you want to make sure that we're still addressing those concerns and um, trying to make sure that when they do need to come in person they come in person but if they're going to be adamant about not coming then you still don't want to lose them and you still want to make sure that you're taking care of those patients and delivering care uh, and so if you have to make an exception I think it's okay um, and it's really important to make sure that children and, and families are healthy during these difficult times and you know kind of that goes to immunizations there's a lot of reports uh, from the CDC I think um, one of the latest ones is actually based on orders for, for immunizations right so uh, clinics were not ordering immunizations because they're not giving immunizations um, and that is a super critical thing right because for the most part uh, even with uh, the Kawasaki-like illness, uh, the multi-system inflammatory uh, response that we're seeing uh, in some children with COVID-19, uh, for the most part, children tend to do very well. Um, and so there are very various other viruses out there uh, that can cause a lot of issues in our children that we have vaccines for, and we don't want to lose the opportunity to keep vaccinating. And it, it's not just the younger children, right? So 
uh, we've done a lot of progress with HPV in adolescents. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're still uh, vaccinating those kids. And a lot of places, what they've done are what's called drive through immunization clinics, uh, where families stay in their car. So just like the drive through COVID test, where you open up your window and you get the swab up your nose. Uh, same thing can be done with an immunization. So you could do the rest of the, the well-child visit via telemedicine and then have them come in for the immunization part. Um, you know, you could potentially also do the finger stick hemoglobin from the car. Um, it's not perfect. It's not ideal. Uh, but, you know, we do have to think about those those things. Um, and again, you know, all these things can be done in conjunction with a, with a virtual visit. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read real quick the, the question. So there's a question about uh, being licensed in California, and there's uh, a concern about treating a patient in another state. Um, there are, there have been some exceptions uh, made in certain states. Uh, I know, for example, Arizona, and I think, don't quote me on this one, but I think Nevada as well, so I'm just not a huge compliance person. Uh, I know for a fact Arizona um, has allowed practitioners who are licensed in another state to practice telemedicine. Um, so that is a possibility. Uh, that you could see patients from other areas as well. Uh, just you just have to make sure that uh, that the state that you're going to be practicing has reciprocal uh, uh, licensing agreements. And again, a lot of these change just now for COVID. Uh, whether that will be maintained after the pandemic, uh, it's kind of yet to be seen. Um, and I, I know there's going to be a talk later on, uh, later in this webinar series about kind of confidentiality and, and teams and all that stuff. But uh, just some of the things that we do in here at Radies, we do have a, an adolescent medicine department. So they strictly deal with teens with lots of teen issues. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy when they're, well, even not as easy, right? So some parents never want to leave the room, but um, just like you would do in person, we have, it's very, a good idea to have a script. Um, so our scripting is we tell families when they schedule the visit that there's going to be a portion of time where the provider is going to speak with the patient alone, um, and you know the, our recommendation usually is for the team to have headphones. Uh, that way, nobody can hear, and then that they also go to a different room. It's just I think the most important thing is to to communicate that in advance with the family so they don't get freaked out when all of a sudden their teenager is leaving. But I think that is super critical in order to get uh, you know valuable and real answers from a teenager, especially when it's in age two. Uh, drug use and sexual activity and other uh, high-risk behaviors uh, that we deal with when when speaking to teens and you want to make sure that you're getting the true answer because that might change uh, what you want to do for them or what you need to do for them. Uh, so it's just, you know, important to think about that there are ways and, and we've done it without a problem where, uh, you know, part of the visit can be done with the parent and then part of the visit can be done with just the teen alone. Uh, and again, and you, you actually, for a lot of if you're ordering, you know, STD or sexual uh, reproductive health issues, you know, you're actually only allowed to talk to the teen about those, right? So if you have a result, you can only talk to the teen unless the teen gives you permission. So you want to make sure you still follow those rules and try to protect their confidentiality as much as possible. Um, so, you know, one of the things to, to think about in, in, in that scheduling and that workflow is, you know, if you ever don't feel comfortable about seeing something via telemedicine, let the family know, right? If you say, I don't think this is something that we can solve the medicine, I need to see you right now. I think you need to make it clear. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying that. You know, we say it all the time. Um, there are certain things that I cannot evaluate via telemedicine. And, you know, just remind them that you're doing everything you can to keep them safe. Uh, the other thing is, you know, calling 911. Um, I think most organizations that do this is you have the family call 911 themselves. You want to be really careful of you trying to call 911 for them because you're not in the same place. Uh, and then also, depending whether you have a landline in your house or a cell phone, it'll go to a different dispatcher. So uh, if you're, you know, in a, even in a different part of the state, you're in a different county, and there may be a very different 911 service. So you don't necessarily want to call 911 for them unless, you know, they're unresponsive and you're seeing it on the video. But if, you know, at all you can, it would be the, the family who calls 911 if needed. Uh, so that's just something to think about. Um, and, you know, I have this here as a different box. Psychiatric emergencies are also emergencies, right? So if, if a teen is actively suicidal, uh, there's concern about self-harm, then oftentimes, you know, the 911 needs to be called or, or what's called a PERT team. 
um, you know, sometimes they're, the family is safe enough that they can drive into the car. You just want to be careful uh, in those circumstances when you're uh, recommending something. Uh, if the family, if the patient is like in severe respiratory distress, uh, you want to be careful whether you recommend somebody going by car. Just um, obviously your liability is different uh, in person versus telemedicine, just because you're not physically there. Uh, but you just want to be careful uh, what you recommend as a provider of how they uh, make it to the subsequent place. Uh, so if they're really critical, you probably just want to have them call 911 in case they need oxygen, right? Something doesn't seem right. Uh, you don't want to risk having a child who decompensates on, on the vehicle on the way to, to the emergency department. Uh, same thing with psychiatric emergencies, right? You want to be careful if the team is like super at risk for self-harm. Uh, you probably don't want them jumping out of a moving car uh, because the family is not going to be able to, to restrain them. So again, you know, I'm not trying to scare you, but you know, th these are things that you have to keep in mind. These are like the less than 0.1% of visits. Uh, but if you just plan and have a good workflow for when and if those things happen, then the rest of it would just be smooth sailing. Um, when you get these handouts, I just picked a, a few uh, resources for you to have. I know there's questions about coding and billing. The AAP has a really good fact sheet. Um, uh, there's some modifiers that you have to add, uh, even though you, you bill for the same level of services of visit, there's some modifiers. Um, there's also been some um, uh, medical changes about being able to bill for telephone only visits as, as full on visits. Uh, again, I think you can deliver a lot better care when you can see somebody face to face and using video is, is pretty useful and pretty critical. Uh, but obviously, I think you should always have a backup plan. Uh, if the technology is failing, then you know, pick up the phone and, and just call the family because the worst thing would be a uh, family who's in trouble and, and you, you don't need. You know, you cancel the visit just because the, the video is not working or something like that. So, you, you know, you want to make sure that you do everything in your power to really address those issues with the family. But um, I think in general, um, everybody has been pretty, um, like most families that I'm interactive have received telemedicine pretty well. But they're actually very satisfied. They're, they're very appreciative. Of being able to see the provider and not having to be there in person. Uh, I know at least one of my kids <laughs> ended up having to see a specialist um, and my wife uh, and I were very appreciative of the specialist that we didn't have to go in uh, with the kids to to an office and potentially expose them to something else. So and again I think if you're not doing it already uh, it can be done especially with the relaxation of the rules right now it can definitely be done and, and I urge you to um, really consider this because your families want it. Uh, and for a lot of the day-to-day -day medicine that we do, it works great. Um, there are just some few and far in between that you might need to see them in person. But for a lot of the regular management, management of chronic disease can actually be done virtually uh, with some exceptions, but it can be done virtually. And I think as you go by, uh, you'll realize that and, and you know this is probably gonna be here with us for the long run. Um, uh, so just think about those things. And you know, one of the things that I didn't th talk about, but it, you know, also to think about is um, if you have families that don't speak English and you you know, don't speak the, their language, uh, you know, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that you might need to have translation services involved with your telemedicine. So just keep that in, in the back of your head as well. Uh, but I, you know, I, I really want to leave a lot of time for questions. So I think we got like 15 minutes. Um, so I will let uh, Amy um, kind of take over and um, go from there. Great. Thank you so much. That was really, um, really informative and really interesting. Um, we do, like you said, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so people are welcome to submit them in the Q&A box or the chat box, and I can consolidate them for you. We did have some pre-questions. Um, so I can um, read you those now. There's a question about how to transition. Um, the easiest way to do that transition to telemedicine if you haven't started your practice in that way. So I think you covered that a little bit, but if you wanted to expound on that for those um, practitioners and agencies that are still sort of contemplating this transition. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest considerations, again, um, if you have a list of patients that are, you know, yet to be seen. Um, I am. Of, uh, one of the things that we do is going through the list of patients that have, you know, upcoming appointments and trying to see based on what those appointments are, whether they could be done via telemedicine. Uh, a lot of places, literally what they did is they just called families and said, hey, your visit has now been changed to telemedicine. I mean, that is one approach. Um, and 
um, other approaches that you just reach out to families and asking them whether you'd be comfortable. I think one of the things that you need to have in place is that infrastructure of who is going to know your platform that you're going to use and who's going to be responsible for uh, having your, your families navigate through that. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is the first time they have a visit and this is completely new to them, kind of getting them into the visit and whether it's a Zoom meeting or whatever it is. You, you really need to have a dedicated person who's going to call that family and make sure that they're ready for the provider to be seen because that can often take quite a bit of time, um, you know, often more than 20 minutes. Uh, as you perfect that process, it gets better, but I think that's what you have to do. Uh, and then from the other part is just, you know, having the technology, picking your platform, sticking to your platform, and then coming up with those workflows of, you know, what's acceptable and how are you going to decide who can be seen that way? I hope that answers the question. I think that does answer the question. Thank you so much. Um, someone had asked if you might expand on hybrid visits a little bit more. Yeah, so um, so hybrid visits would be um, where you do part of the, the visit via telemedicine. So I'm going to give you an urgent care example. So let's say I have a family whose child is complaining of uh, burning with urination. That's been going on for a couple of days. Uh, they're stable enough, like they don't have fever, they don't have a lot of systemic symptoms, so something that I feel comfortable. Uh, you know, even if it is a UTI, we wait a day or two to get a, an antibiotic and then it's not the end of the world, right? Um, so what I would do in that case is I could have the whole video visit, the exam, all through the telemedicine, and then they can go into a location, whether it's your clinic or a lab for the labs. So I think that could also be done for concern for strep throat, right? So they could either come into the clinic just to get a urine sample or get a swab, uh, or they can go to a lab, right? So if you have, I'm going to throw a lab, um, lab quest, um, not a huge fan of them, but uh, uh, any lab, uh, it's just the one that came up with my mind, but uh, you can send them to lab quest and then you can have them drop off the sample there and then you'd get the results. And as soon as you get the results, then you call the family back. Um, so that's one hybrid model. The other hybrid model is, you know, with regard to well child visits, again, if you do all the screenings, as much of the exam as you can via telemedicine, and then they come into the office for their vaccines. Um, the, um, so yeah, th those are, those are kind of the way, uh, you know, I think that's different from a conversion from, from telemedicine to in-person. So conversion, what I would think of that would be, it started the telemedicine and then, you know, you're like, mm, yeah, this something doesn't seem right. I need to see you in person right away. And they drive, you know, I would say within minutes, two hours to your clinic. I mean, obviously, depending on the problem, if they're in severe distress, they probably should just go to the ED, but um, you have them come in and you just get converted. So I think that's different because you just completely switch the visit to in person and you're probably going to redo a lot of it. You're, you're going to re-examine them in person. Uh, but hybrid, I mean that you can do a lot of your screening, a lot of your exam, a lot of the talking part um, via telemedicine and then just have them come in. And an example is even in a specialist, right? So let's say you're an allergy doctor you can have a whole visit and then they need to go for the skin testing. Well, then they just go to the clinic and the doctor doesn't even need to be there. The, you know, uh, another advanced practitioner can be there and they can do the skin test. Um, and then, you know, the, the visit got split into two, but it's still part of the same visit. That's very helpful. And I think it connects to this other question I just received about how to sort of use telehealth to make up for lost time as we start getting to the place of reopening clinics. Um, there's a question of, does it help with effectiveness to sort of split physicals by doing the pre-visits on telehealth and the physical exam in person? Um, yeah, sort of all that catch-up that you were mentioning of, the, of uh, preventative and maintenance care that hasn't happened during this time. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on your bandwidth. I mean, you could definitely, um, if you have the bandwidth to separate them, that might be a good thing. Um, you may want to catch up first with your higher risk patients, uh, the ones with chronic conditions, and just make sure that they're okay and they still have all their medications. Um, I think the biggest thing is like just go ahead and, and get started because uh, you, you really won't know what's going on with your population until you kind of ramp back up again. Um, you know, one of the biggest fears that we all have, and you know, at least in pediatrics, it hasn't necessarily panned out from what I've seen, but you know, in adults, there's been a lot of concerns about people not seeking care for, you know, uh, heart attacks and strokes. Um, in kids, at least from our experience here, from what we've seen, for those critical conditions, they're still seeking care. 
but there may be other things that families don't consider critical, but are still, you know, very important, like their chronic disease that they may not be following up with. So I would just say, you know, try to, if you have limited resources and try to stratify by, you know, the ones you need to see sooner rather than later, but, you know, having a list and make sure you don't leave anybody behind is still also important, right? You want to make sure that everybody gets seen and just catching up, including vaccines, right? So make sure you're reviewing people's vaccines and try to catch them up as well. That's a great point. I mean, that actually maybe relates to the, the bigger sort of set of questions that we had received previously about reproductive and sexual health and how do we um, sort of help adolescents stay on top of that care when they might have gotten behind in their birth control or in thinking preventatively about keeping themselves safe sexually. Yeah, and I actually, and that, that's part of why I read, uh, brought up the point of care uh, urine, uh, because point of care pregnancy test. Uh, some places um, have been having the teens buy an over-the-counter urine pregnancy test because they are pretty accurate, right? And so you could have the teens uh, dip their urine at home. Um, and again, you'd have to talk to your organization how comfortable you would feel doing that. Uh, but, you know, especially when re-prescribing birth control, you still want to make sure that they're uh, not currently pregnant. Uh, then if they are, you know, that changes everything. Uh, so that is one way that it could be done, right? So it's point of care testing at the point of care, which is in, in their home. Um, you know, the, you would handle it the same way. So I think a lot of places where you see teens on their own for sexual and reproductive health, you would still do the same thing. Um, obviously, again, if you have a, if you're using like family pack for the billing, because uh, I think what the part that gets tricky is for places where you are actually billing the family, because then they'll be like, well, what was this visit that I wasn't aware of, uh, and you can breach confidentiality in that way. So you you kind of want to follow the same structure that you currently have, and um, you know whatever consent is needed, but you should in theory still be able to do everything you can, uh, because again, you know if they're uh, of legal age in California for consenting for sexual and reproductive health. You should still be able to do everything, uh, but again, if you have a, you know, implant on or other things, then, you know, obviously, have to, or you know, they need a depot shot, then that could be a hybrid visit where you do most of it, and then they still have to come in for the shot. That uh, you should be able to do all those things, and just ensuring that, again, they're they're having their doctor visits a little private now. You know, if they're locked up at home and they have a single bedroom house it might be a little bit more difficult. So you want to make sure that you talk to your team before the visit and say, hey, is this even going to be feasible? Um, mm -hmm. But you know, that's a good point, right? Because they're not leaving their house. You know, they can go on a walk, that would work. Uh, but um, just some of the things to consider. Great, thank you. I think we have about two more minutes. Are there any last questions from any of the participants? I think that might be everything. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will be posting the slides as well as the recording, as well as additional resources on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org. And I believe that is right here. Um, and we hope to see you at future webinars. So we have the next one is June 3rd, next week at 1 p.m. on youth engagement and how school-based health centers are still trying to do youth engagement during this time. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there were two questions that came right um, right at the end, so since we have uh, a few more minutes, one um, is for CSHA, which is our, their CEUs offered for these webinars, and unfortunately, we're not able to offer CEUs right now, and um, we are looking into it for some of our um, workshops during our conference, which will be the first week of October. We're going to have an um, in-depth virtual school-based health conference, and we're hoping to have some CEUs as part of that, but we cannot offer these ones um, for these webinars right now. Um, and then a question for Dr. Bielotowski. Um, have there been any cases where providers are being sued for care that's provided on telehealth? So, you know what, I, I imagine they have. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I haven't looked at that literature, uh, but I, I imagine they have, right? So, um, you know, when, I think that's an important part of talking about your compliance and, and risk management, um, you know, you're in making sure that you're still covered with your own malpractice insurance. Um, but, you know, your liability is usually different uh, because you're not a person. And again, you know, for every, pretty much everything in medical care, uh, as long as you're doing what a reasonable physician in your position would do, 
uh, and you're documenting that, then you're covered. I think the biggest thing um, that I tell people, especially right now with telemedicine being new, is that you really uh, are clear about what you told families and what you, and your documentation, uh, especially when you're telling them to do something else beyond this visit, right? So especially when people look pretty sick uh, and you're sending them somewhere, uh, because we all know, you know, oftentimes families don't follow through, uh, but all you can do is, you know, make a recommendation, right? You're not there, you can't physically take them somewhere else. Um, and just, um, yeah, and then, you know, I'm gonna make a plug to our uh, friends in uh, child welfare, you know, there's, you know, there's concerns of uh, increases in violence in the home. So, you know, just keeping an eye out for, uh, you know, strange bruises, strange things, uh, make sure that uh, if you see something, you're still a mandated reporter, right? And just because you know, you're here through telemedicine, you're still a mandated reporter. Uh, so just make sure we keep our kids safe out there. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're saying sort of really careful documentation and really careful observation. Um, another question came up right now related to that is any specific or extra coverage needed for malpractice for telehealth? I think it would vary by your coverage, but you know, especially right now with the expansion of services, I think you should be covered, but I, I would just triple check with your particular provider. I know for us, we didn't have to change anything, but it's part of our, um, it was part of our coverage that I would just triple check. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as we wrap up, I just wanna say thank you again so much to Dr. Bielodowski and for um, Myra Alvarez from the Children's Partnership and um, for all of Simolina for sponsoring the series and to all of our partners and to all of you for taking time out of your busy day to be here with us. Um, the next two webinars are up on the screen and on our website and we hope to see you all again very soon. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you everybody.